and welcome to a special edition of Rebel Force Radio. We're going to do something a little bit different than the usual show. We're going to be taking a deep dive into one of the latest additions to the Star Wars comic book canon, and that's the Age of Resistance one-shot Snoke issue that came out just this week. And um, the reason this sort of jumped up to our attention is that this is a character that has been given a lot of what I like to say gravitas important since he made his debut in the force awakens. He had that larger than life wizard of Oz like introduction. And you know, the, the visual cues were that this was a very, very powerful being. At least that's how I interpret it. There are other interpretations out there. And then of course we know what happens in the last Jedi and uh, so any opportunity we have to learn a little bit more about this character, uh, I'm going to take it. And, you know, if you've been listening to Rebel Force Radio, I'm not a huge fan of the stuff that happens outside of the screen, the books, the comics. I, I kind of pick and choose, but this one I couldn't resist. And uh, Jimmy Mack makes it so easy. Join Jimmy Mack right here joining me oh he's still buried he's still buried in the uh in the floppy floppy <laughs> copy i say well, he like, makes it easy for me because right yeah he walks to the uh, local comic book shop buys the floppy and then redeems the digital code so that i have something that i can read on my ipad it, it works out really really well but i had this all started uh with a conversation jim you and i had because i saw the headlines this is what happened so a new star wars comic gets released you got a bunch of clickbaity websites out there. They start reading it and then putting these headlines together that, you know, sometimes don't even resemble what actually happens in the comic book. Um, they throw out a theory. They put it, at, they wrap it, uh, you know, in a, as a headline. And then all of a sudden everybody starts going crazy. And it's like, well, just read the book and then talk about it. So that's what we've done. We've, we've read the book and we're going to just kind of go through what happens in the story and then how we think it relates to the uh, overall Star Wars saga, specifically as it relates to Kylo Ren and Snoke. Jim, you said that for the most part, these one offs haven't been your favorites in terms of recent Star Wars comics. No, they've been hit or miss. They've been hit or miss. There's been several issues under the banner of uh, Age of the Republic, Age of Rebellion, Age of Resistance, and uh, they vary in quality, if you ask me, um, but they're, they're interesting just to take a uh, focus on a character and, and really get into it that you probably couldn't do in any of these other regular titles from Marvel, so I have them all, so uh, <laughs> uh the uh, age of resistance is where we're at with this yeah. Supreme Leader Snoke. No indication really as to where on the timeline this happens, but you'd have to assume it happens within the f you know, few years prior to the events of The Force Awakens. Yeah, that's where one thing that I noticed was that uh, the artwork, you know, there were times that Kylo Ren looked quite young. On some of the panels, and there were times that he looked just like the Kylo Ren that we were used to in the film. So, yeah, it was hard for me to pick out exactly uh, when this happens. I think they're leaving it somewhat ambiguous, you know, but it's you're right. It's somewhere before the events of The Force Awakens. Um, we should give some credit here um, to Tom Taylor, the story, the, the writer, uh, Leonard Kirk, who did pencils. And uh, what, what else we got here? Uh, uh, you know what? Let's just say Tom Taylor wrote it. Leonard Kirk did the art and the cover was by Phil Noto. I know no, no, none of them. So all these guys, uh, all those people, there they are. OK, right. Um, so really what we're here to do is kind of put this in context with what we know about these characters and what we might expect to see uh, in the rise of Skywalker as a result of some of these things. Um, the one thing that kind of jumped out at me right away, Jim, is that in this comic book, 
Uh, Snoke really is sort of the anti Yoda. It's like everything that we saw Yoda do in the Empire Strikes Back, like Snoke is doing the exact opposite. I mean, the first thing that we see him doing to Kylo Ren is uh, suspending him over these uh, (laughs) stalagmites uh, in this cave um, and then, you know, leaving it to himself to leaving it to him to save himself. uh, This is almost like uh, torture as opposed to training. Yeah. And there have been stories in the past about how Palpatine trained Darth Maul. And uh, I seem to remember one, I think it was a young adult novel, where Palpatine kept throwing Maul into the ocean. And then he'd swim ashore and then Palpatine would throw him back in the ocean when he was like very young. Yeah. And, uh, and so that, yeah, it seems torturous, but that's just how the Sith roll or how the dark side rolls. We've never really been heard confirmation. We've never really heard confirmation as to whether or not Snoke is truly a Sith or if he's just a practitioner of the dark side. Yeah. They've skated around that stuff. That's right. And that was, that's been a problem that I've had with this character is because they haven't committed. And that's okay if the non-commitment is leading up to something committal later. But he died before we got any type of commitment or any type of uh, meaningful backstory. That's what, what was kind of, you know, unsatisfying about it. And so, you know, these comics come out and we hope that they're going to have you know, give us some sort of meaning behind the character. So it does. It takes you through training, um, like the anti Yoda, like you said, where as opposed to Yoda teaching Luke how to use the force to achieve physical greatness that he's never had before, um, Snoke just simply uses it to show his power off to Kylo and then to use Kylo's fear to make him more powerful. So that's pretty effective. You know, I like that. It's, it's like, it's story... like Sith scared straight. <laughs> well, you know, scared a Sith. <laughs> it's a little bit. It's, he's trying to teach him how to exploit his fear and yeah. use it to power him. You know, right. it's like, uh, before you go on stage and you have butterflies in your stomach or whatever, and you, you end up doing great on stage and you realize that you were kind of powered by your own fear a little bit. So, yeah. So he makes him face death and, uh, I'm not really sure if he passes the test or not. Um, he doesn't die. So no, think- he does save himself. So at some point, you know, Snoke yeah. lets go. So he's, he's hanging over these, uh, these spikes at the bottom of this, of this large Canyon and Snoke lets go. Snoke is obviously what's holding Kylo up. He lets go. Uh, Kylo plummets down, and right at the very end, he's able to, you know, finally get the uh, the power to to save himself. And then at one point, he's like, um, "Supreme Lord, if I wouldn't have saved myself, would you have saved me?" Yeah. He's like, "No, that's what Skywalker would have done." Yeah. <laughs> And you notice in a lot of these panels, it's a close-up of Snoke's hand and the ring on his hand. I was thinking you might bring that up because there's been a lot of scuttlebutt about the ring getting so much attention in these panels. And there's also been speculation about that that ring is some sort of Star Wars version of a Horcrux uh, for you Harry Potter fans out there that is you know is is created or inhabited by the spirit of palpatine or is the, is you know is palpatine animating snoke is snoke some sort of corpse or you know some sort of uh being that is you know being used by palpatine you know, who knows do you think look at it that cuz you brought up the 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 ring do you think there's a possibility that you're looking at some sort of possession or some sort of uh Palpatine Snoke connection. Is that what we're looking at in some way? I don't think it's that easy. I, that seems very easy to me. And with Snoke being dead, I think that removes the possibility of that 
happening in the rise of Skywalker, if that's what you're alluding to, will the return of Palpatine somehow be tied into this ring? Like when Voldemort made his triumphant return in Harry Potter. You know, I, I don't see that. I don't see that. I think they have to, according to the rumors I've heard, the first half of the film is going to feature the heroes and the villains, both in search of essentially Palpatine. Mm. Well, they look for a device or something. Okay. Take them to Palpatine. But I don't think that device is going to be Snoke's ring. I think that's misleading. Gotcha. It would, I would say there's more possibility of that happening if Snoke were alive for episode nine, but he's not going to be. Yeah, well, something's going to lead them to the Death Star. I mean, that those shots of them looking at the remains of the Death Star tell me sure. that that's, that's some sort of destination there. Um, like they finally made it. You know, there's that pan back of the heroes as they're finally looking at the thing they've been, um, you know, uh, on a quest for. Uh, it's got that sort of epic quality to that shot. Um, you know, there's another thing that really popped out at me in this uh, issue is the moment where Snoke gets ticked off again. Now, we, we, we saw Snoke in The Last Jedi sort of denigrate the mask. You're just a child in a yeah. mask, right? And we see in this I issue, he's also, he's telling him to not hide behind the mask. And he says, you cannot pretend to be Vader in this place. So after he uh, manages to not get impaled by the stalactites or stalagmites, what is it? You might trip and they have to ha hang tight to the ceiling. That's right. So stalagmites are the ones on the bottom. Stalactites are the ones on the top. So after he avoids being impaled, Snoke says he's going to take him somewhere. And this is a place where you cannot pretend to be Vader. So that tells you right there that the whole mask was like was totally Kylo's idea. <laughs> right. Well, he gets dogged about that right. also in this this Hux comic book. OK, oh. He gets dogged about that by Hux of all people. Really? So Hux is yeah. tearing him down. He says to him, okay, um, they, they're stranded, okay? They crash landed. Mm -hmm. And Hux and Kylo Ren are the only two who survived the crash. And they start snipping at each other, you know? And um, Hux says... Some way, oh, so it's assumed that the crash landing was sabotage. And he goes, someone in your army tried to kill you. Clearly managed to inspire a lot of loyalty, Hux. And then Hux responds, oh, please. I don't <laughs> even... <laughs> Wait, Hux is comic book guy. Well, the first thing he said, <laughs> I love it. Oh, please. And so I couldn't <laughs> help but go into the comic book. I love I, Hank Azaria doing the voice of Hux. <laughs> please, please, uh, no, I can't. I oh, can't. Oh, please. It, but, oh, please. <laughs> I thought you could read minds, Ren. You honestly believe people hate me more than they hate you with your petulant tantrums and your... <laughs> and then Hux goes, or uh, Kylo goes, and my what? Vader wore his mask because he couldn't breathe without it, but you, you just play dress up to hide the faces <laughs> of those level scum parents. <laughs> Come on, there's no way. Says, oh, this stuff. But I mean, it makes sense. It actually. does. Why does he wear the mask? He says, you play dress up to hide the faces of your rebel scum parents. Oh, yes. And, you, and here you got Snoke saying you cannot pretend to be Vader in this place and hide behind a mask. Oh, please. <laughs> What's killing me about some of this is they're kind of like breaking the fourth wall. It's almost like the material is criticizing the material a little bit well, here. And that's kind of... It's, do you know what I'm getting at? That, that has been happening. I mean, what with the whole Luke Skywalker. I thought he was a myth. And uh -huh. Uh -huh. kids playing with makeshift action figures at the end of episode eight. And the commentary on... Uh, you know, I, it, it's just I, it, there's a lot of commentary going on there that yeah, I think yeah, yeah, yeah. I read between the lines. And I think, you know, the, the kill the past even, uh, you know, a lot of people have interpreted that to mean that it, it's uh, let go of the things that 
the older generation have grown to love and move forward with something different. And I'm fine with that, but just not with the characters of Luke and Leia and Chewie. And I mean, stay true to the story, tr- stay consistent. So, but that's a, that's a commentary that has nothing to do with this comic book. Not yet. At least I think, well, it's, but it is, but it is interesting that, that, um, this star Wars sort of refers to itself a little bit more than old Star Wars did. Do you know what I'm saying? Like that, oh, yeah. it's it's uh, I don't, it's self-aware, I guess is the term. It's like, it's aware that it's Star Wars. Like it's how kinda, Rose is in awe of meeting Finn. Yeah, right. It's almost like saying this is what it's like when the fans get obsessive about the characters. A little bit. Yeah, a little bit. You want to look at it that way. Yeah, yeah. You don't have to, but I think there's something buried in there sometimes. I, I, well, I do, too. I mean, you never saw the characters falling all over themselves, you know, in, in the original trilogy or the prequel trilogy. It's not like, you know, oh, my gosh, you're you're Padme. That kind of self-awareness always bothered me. It yeah. would always bother me when. In the Star Wars novels, they would feature media coverage of what was happening. Oh, right. I was like, yeah, oh, right. that ruins the whole thing, you know? There was even a song at one point written about Darth Vader and his and his uh, mechanical parts. Yes, in the, air, in the book Heir to the Jedi, which was the very first novel of the new canon post uh, the Disney purchase oh. 2014 and the... Uh, the um, the uh, wiping out essentially of the expanded universe. The first novel was a book called the heir to the Jedi and featured a Darth Vader song and dance number. And uh, boy, I thought, about Oh, I that. can't handle it. I can't handle it. All right. So where are they going? So he says, this is a place that you can't hide behind a mask and it's Dagobah. Yes. It's, Dagobah. And now again, promoting the self-awareness of the citizens of the galaxy about the entire Star Wars story, you know? Mm-hmm. They're going to Dagobah. Why are they going to Dagobah? Well, you'd have to assume that Luke Skywalker had told someone his story at some point. Or probably even to Kylo Ren himself. And, you know, taught you know, talked about the vision he received in the dark side cave and everything. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, um, I think Jason, you and me were wondering about just the general knowledge of the galaxy about the whereabouts of Dagobah. Is it a place that Yoda maybe had removed from the archives, uh, much like Camino was removed? That's by- how I inter. That's why I thought that whole, uh, you know reference to or that whole you know sequence where they were showing how Camino had been hidden and taken from the star charts I thought oh they're planting the seed that that's how Yoda learned to hide Dagobah right but no I don't think so but no I think uh Dagobah was a place that appeared on star charts when old Ben appeared to Luke and uh, said, uh, Luke, Luke, wait, wait, Luke, <laughs> you, you will go to the Dagobah system. Dagobah system? There you will learn from Yoda, the Jedi Master who instructed me. Ben! And Snoke. Oh, I forgot to tell him about Snoke. Ben! Snoke. I'm already, I've already faded out. He's yelling my name. I can't, he can't hear me. Ben! This connection sucks. <laughs> Worst cell phone connection ever. Well, I met uh, the, uh, the Jedi Master who instructed me and Snoke. <laughs> but we got cut off before he heard that. Uh, that screws up everything. All right, so they're going to Dagobah. Okay, so they're going to Dagobah. So some, somehow word gets around that this place is, uh, this is a great place to go if you're training young Jedi or, in this case, young Sith. So they're, mm. they're heading out to Dagobah, and 
Um, there's an exchange between Snoke and Kylo that's interesting where Kylo is sort of uh, reverential in his talk about Luke Skywalker. And, um, you know, Kylo is like, why do you why do you speak of him with respect? And he says he has earned my respect and my fear. This is kind of self-revealing. Um Snoke saying that he is scared, has fear of Skywalker. Skywalker has the ability to bring back the Mm -hmm. the uh, the Jedi ways. Um, Kylo says he is weak. Snoke says he is not weak. He is just misguided. So he is teaching Kylo to, in some ways, respect his enemy, not to underestimate his enemy. And that in some ways, at least according to Sith doctrine, that there is strength to be found in the fear you have of your enemy. Yes. So he's not just but, dissing, you know, Luke. No, and the thing that surprises me is when he speaks that way of Luke. You have to think that at some point Luke and Snoke had a one-on-one with each other hmm. where Snoke was taught a lesson. Either that or he's just somehow the empire, the emperor reincarnated. And he's speaking from his past experiences with Luke Skywalker, Uh which I think could very well be a possibility. I think that they might be trying to tie the Emperor into the character of Snoke. They probably should have just made Snoke the Emperor in the first place, but that's neither here nor there. The guy's in the story, and he's who he is, and we have no indication that he even has any sort of connection to Palpatine. But he certainly knows the events of the past, and he knows everything he needs to know about Vader. Could Snoke have been someone Vader at one point had defeated? Mm, right. I don't know. I mean, it's just so many questions. But he says he's not weak, he's misguided, which goes back to what the Emperor said. You know, If he could be turned, he'd be a powerful ally. So obviously the goal is to turn Luke toward the side of the dark side where he could reach his full potential um, according to these dark side parish- uh, parishioners, practitioners. <laughs> I could say parishioners too, the dark yeah, side. Maybe. Church. Maybe. Right. You know, they, they pass around the plate on Sunday morning and uh, you make a donation to the cause <laughs> uh, or else. <laughs> now, um, once they get to the cave uh jim one of our you know favorite quotes that we often recite here on rfr is when yoda and luke have that exchange and he says well what's in there and yoda says only what you take with you and so when i see that i'm thinking to myself you know that it's a it's it's not so much a that the the place itself has any power. It's that the mind, the consciousness of the person going into the place, in this case, the cave, has the power. But then we've also seen in the Clone Wars, in the, in the Mortis arc, where Qui-Gon talks about how Mortis is a, is a magnifier of the force an amplifier i believe is what he calls it an amplifier of the force so when we think about this cave where does the power lie does it does it lie from the master who is administering the lesson in empire it's yoda in this case it's snoke does it lie within the apprentice does it lie within the physical place ah well i have a hang up with the force being a place you can go to Mm -hmm. And that was a big issue I had with the world between worlds in Star Wars Rebels is that I just don't like the convenience for storytelling by creating a place that is the force. You know, we call it whatever you want, a nexus, a world between worlds, a portal. I don't like the idea of the force being a place you can visit. I think the force exists within the person. And everything around them is an extension of what goes on with their one-on-one relationship with the mystical energy field. So 
I think that I had always assumed that when Yoda said strong with the dark side, it is, um, I don't think he's necessarily talking about what's going on in the cave. I think he's talking about what's going on in the vision. Luke is about Ray to receive. And I think they're two very different things. Mm, mm. I've never assumed the dark side cave, and that's what we call it even. We even call it the dark side yeah, cave. Right. But I never assumed it was the cave itself generating the visions. Right. Now, you've right. seen storytelling in Star Wars attempt to go there in the past. I believe at the uh, Mission to Mount Yoda book <laughs> from the old Glove of Darth Vader series may have gone to the Dark Side Cave. It's been years and years and years since I've even considered that part of the canon. Um, but I definitely know in The Force Unleashed, the Star Killer went to the Dark Side Cave and he received a Dark Side vision. And in that circumstance, it seemed like the message the storytellers were saying was that it's the cave itself that is enhanced by the dark side of the force, as opposed to it being only what you take with you, which is what Yoda said. Right. And what Yoda says only what you take with you means that the vision was all Luke's and it was his experience. Yes. It was only and, what you take with you yes. in your mind. Right. Your, your focus as but Qui-Gon I don't would say. think it, the dark side cave is like an amusement park attraction that you wait in line for and go in and have your dark side vision. <laughs> yeah, coming soon to Galaxy's Edge. <laughs> the dark side cave. Yeah. What's in there? Only what you take with you. Oh, oh. Well, 1995. Here, hold, hold my thermal detonator Coca-Cola <laughs> while I go in there. Yeah, I thought yeah. it was just part of Luke's vision, and Yoda was very keen on all uh, of that happening, being an instructor of Jedi for centuries like he was. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think they took every candidate for the Jedi temple to go to Dagobah and train in the dark side cave. Right. I think it was all in Luke's head, and it was just the the fact that the the cave was there I, I always thought yoda had a lot to do with promoting the vision too you know i did too i remember as a kid watching him with that uh with that uh gimme stick he's kind of stirring it around in front of him you know while yeah. luke is in there and i thought that he was conjuring something now this is you know 9 10 11 year old jason and i still have those thoughts when i'm watching the film uh, I thought he was sort of bringing something about, or at least enabling something. Um, I, I, you know, I, I could be wrong. I think it's more about what Luke is bringing with him. I'm going to take Yoda at face value of what he's saying. Yes. What's in there, only what you take with you. And and I, I read that to be in your mind, in your yeah. consciousness, your focus. Qui-Gon Jinn expands on that when right. he says your focus determines your reality. So if Luke was focused on a Mardi Gras parade, when he went into the dark side cave, he might have found that. That's what he would see. <laughs> Girls up in the balcony, lifting up their shirts, throwing beads down to people, drinking on the streets, projectile vomiting. Good old-fashioned Mardi That'd Gras. It'd be great if that's exactly how it worked. You know, I would probably... Although I have, and every, you know, people have done this, where you try to, like, have certain dreams at night, and you try to, like, think about it before you go into bed. I won't get into detail, but, uh, you know, you, you try to think about... Um, so when, when Snoke asks the question about what's in there, uh, he gets a different response, or when, when, when Kylo, I should say, asks the, the Luke Skywalker question, well, what's in there? Only what you take with you. It's not only what you take with you. In this case, it is only what you've been too weak to bury. Mm. So here so, he is. Yeah. Uh, so only they're saying, you know, you turn on the dark side when you walk into this cave. This cave, the environment is strong. The, the environment itself is strong with the dark side of the force. And that's also something Yoda said. Well, but wait a minute. Is it? Is it? Because... What, what Snoke is saying is only what you're too weak to bury. So in, the, so in this case, is it... All right, so Luke, only what you take with you. Luke's taking with himself, uh, taking in with himself 
that hatred of Vader who dis- who who killed Obi Wan Kenobi, the closest thing that Luke at that point had really had to a a father figure of any repute um, or had a real connection with. Yeah, Owen, but still, I mean, Ben was the mentor, uh, the the Campbellian mentor. So Luke's got a lot of anger issues with with Vader and Yoda is there to show him that, hey, if you don't, you know, mind your P's and Q's, this could be you. If you don't listen to what I'm saying to you, you know, opens the mask and it's Luke inside. Yeah. Now, that's the message. That's the message. If you keep going down this path, this is going to be you. So, so, so how could a message like that have any foundation in the dark side? Because the message itself was conveying a warning to Luke. I don't see anything evil about the message Luke received in the dark side cave. And he certainly, and he failed when he went in there too. Yoda called him out and said, you're a failure. I set you up with this great dark side stuff, and what do you do? You strike out at <laughs> right. it. He does look very disappointed in him when he comes out. Well, he, he said, said that. He said that. That is why you fail. Uh, well, that was in that was in context. That was to about the death, the lifting the axe. Lifting the axe. It was all leading to that point. But there is a moment in one of those brilliant Kirshner character moments where you know Luke's looking down at the 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 helmet the, the mask that's busted up and they flash to Yoda and R2 mm-hmm. and R2 looks over very concerned it's almost like R2 is 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 following along the action with the with the audience yeah. cuz he yeah. looks and then Yoda just kind of just looks down he's very disappointed in the way that this has turned out uh, or it's another way to interpret it is that Yoda himself is 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 learning about Luke's weaknesses yes. while he's watching this unfold. And then that brings us back to uh, this comic book. So he says, you know, only what you're too weak to bury. Well, what is that? And that is Luke Skywalker and his parents, Han and Leia. And you've got Luke here appearing to Kylo with the line that we hear him give to his own father. Uh, I will. I, yeah, I won't fight you. He says, I don't want to fight you. Um, Now, I could go on a little bit of a tangent about the decisions that were made to to put Luke Skywalker in a position where he was, you know, committing. um, Was that when you kill children? What is that? Not not genocide, not patricide. Kidicide. I guess. (laughs) Whatever it is. But, you know, I have never it has never really sat that well with me that. Our hero, Luke Skywalker, and this is before his breakdown, mind you, right? This is before the big breakdown that sent him marooned onto Octu. that our hero, Luke Skywalker, came this close to killing his own nephew because of a concern that he had that he was too powerful in the dark side. Um, that's been a that's been a problem. But you know what? It is what it is. We got to take it for, you know, what it you know, that it's part of the story. But in this case, you've got the spirit of Luke Skywalker saying to Kylo, you know, I, I don't want to fight you. Well, could have fooled me with the moment when Luke confronts Kylo in that flashback and he's going to kill him in his sleep. Would the story be any different to you if we learned that Luke was being told by the spirit of Yoda? Or by the spirit of Qui-Gon or Obi-Wan that he needed to take action or else. Or if something was possessing Luke to to push him in that direction. Would that change the story for you? If you look, because it's the same circumstance. He was sent off to the Death Star 2 to confront Darth Vader, his father, and kill him. And that is the mis- mission Yoda and Obi-Wan wanted him to go on at that point. Yeah. Luke even said, I can't do it. I can't kill my own father. And then, you know, Ben basically reveals that, but this is this was our plan all along, right. kid. He's like, well, then the Emperor has already won. Yeah. So it's over. <laughs> so, so th- yes, yeah. yes. So you you're, you have a Luke who's going off to, to confront his father, 
And Luke at that point reveals he believes there's the light side still existing and that he is, we know all along that Luke is going there to try to convince Vader to turn to the light. Mm. And they duel and Luke throws his saber away right at the moment, just like with Kylo, you know, right at the moment, he's going to deliver that killing blow and he turns off the saber. And so what happens? He has to pay the price for his lack of follow through. His with lack the Emperor, of vision. Was, <laughs> his lack of it. With the Emperor, it was via the Force Lightning. With yeah. Kylo Ren, it was via his ability to pull the roof down on. <laughs> yeah. See, if Kylo did that, wouldn't he also be crushed by the roof as well? <laughs> well, Kylo apparently has a penchant for this. We'll get to that in just a second because he does that with the cave. So we got we got Luke saying, you know, I will not fight you. Um, like he does in uh, at the end of Return of the Jedi. And here he is saying it again to, to Kylo. Well, Kylo doesn't really care because he makes pretty good oh, work of... Smoked. Yeah. Um, smoked. God, that's hard to see, actually. Yeah, look at that. That is something, isn't it? Yeah, it's Luke coming out of the chest, and there's a Luke. He's got his fancy uh, off-white robes on. <laughs> again, if someone's going to remove themselves entirely from the Jedi order. Why does he still wear the Jedi robes? And why would he go to the birthplace of the Jedi order? The first Jedi temple. Yeah, why I, would he do that? You know, I was just having a conversation uh, earlier today with uh, a friend about that very thing. And I said, that would be like me getting on a plane to Jerusalem to go to the site of the crucifixion to become an atheist, to renounce my Christianity. Yeah. Like, why would I go? Why would I spend the, the time, the effort, you know, to go to the holiest place, according to my faith, <laughs> just to renounce it? It, it, it really it really makes no sense. It it's like, hey, hey, yo, Jake Skywalker, I notice you have a Christmas tree set up in the front room. But you're not celebrating Christmas this year. What's up with that? Oh, that's just how I roll. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's right. Uh, so he makes quick work uh, oh, of. Uh, look, look at that. Yeah, isn't that that is something? And I mean, makes, the artwork in this comic is fantastic. You know, I mean, we're really focused on the story and all right, that. Right, right. Of course, these are very talented people. There's no, no question about it. But we see then um, that that's not it. His, his challenge is not over. So upon taking out Luke, he has another uh, cross to, uh, to bear. He has, a, he has another test, and it's Luke, or excuse me, it's Han and Leia, the it's parents. Mom and dad. Mom and and dad. dad. Look at Han. What, yeah, what's what going on doing? with that hair? Yeah, would you go to Bowricks or something? <laughs> Are you cutting your own hair now? What? Come on. I, <laughs> we can do better than this. Yeah. He's got a really bad side part in those. That what's wrong with those pants? Is a terrible haircut. It's right. almost as if he just took a scissors to his head and didn't even have a mirror. And just... Is it me or am I the only one seeing Shemp here a little bit? A little bit. A little bit. It's not long enough, though. Or uh, it's greasy <laughs> enough. It's not long enough. <laughs> All right. So he takes out Luke without even thinking. Of course, Uncle Luke, he's gone. And then Kylo or excuse me, then uh, Snoke says, all right, well, you've got more to this challenge. And he's got the parents there. And basically what he does is he kind of fakes Snoke out. He fakes him out. So he does not impale the vision of Lu of Han. I keep wanting to say Luke. Of yeah. Han and Leia. He starts just cutting up some of the tree bark and foliage around him. <laughs> I, I, I guess. I don't know. So, so where, do you, where do you get this from? Number one, we know that Kylo is fond for trashing the place when he throws his, his little tempy tantrums. Yes. Um, but yeah, this doesn't, I mean, is this an attempt to fake out Snoke? Is he taking yes, out? Yes, this is a total Gresham? fake out. So this is, this is a fake out. So he's creating a false situation. So what Snoke hears what's going on. See, again, the connection between the master and apprentice is, in a, in a moment when the apprentice is having this force vision, I think is a profound moment for the master itself. 
I always felt like when Yoda was sitting out there, he was connected to all the events that were happening. So I think Snoke is a little more connected to what's going on here in the tree cave. And it's not like anything that Kylo can BS his way out of at this point. Well, you would, you wouldn't think so, but you know what I'm, what I'm getting from this is, yeah, I definitely think that there's a difference between, um, Yoda's ability to sort of watch what's going on with Luke, at least, I don't know that he's literally watching so much as, as he's kind of in Luke's head. He's watching it through Luke or perhaps reading uh, Luke's um, level of anger, fear, whatever it is, the emotion. I think he's reading the emotion of the moment. And so is Snoke here. And so we see Snoke... Um, at one point, he says, uh, oh, this is great. Uh, he says, well done, my apprentice. Is it? It is finished. I would like to see. So after he feels Kylo just wigging out on, you know, this, whatever this is, the inside of this cave, he wants to see. He wants to walk in there and see the... Now, wait, here's a question. Does he want to physically walk into the cave and see this image? Or is he trying to get into kylo's head here like let me see into your head what you have done i i don't know i, I guess it's could it be metaphorical or literal who knows well the dark side connection to the force is obviously different than the light side yes the light side says the dark side clouds everything and so that prevents the force user from being able to fully tap into the light side of the force on the other side of the coin the dark side user believes that he is using the force to its fullest potential because I think the dark side user sometimes lies to himself and says, I am doing this for the just of society. I am doing this to promote peace and freedom. So they think they're using the force in a better way. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, but they're using the dark side of the force and they yeah. know exactly what they're doing. And I think at the end of the day, all dark siders are lying to themselves. They're not able to tap into the fullest potential of the force because they truly are not using the light side. They're lying to themselves. And so they say, well, we have to be fully immersed in the darkness and all that. Well, what good is that? Then you're leaving a whole other part of the force untapped. Well, they would they, say the opposite. They would say, you know, Palpatine's uh, pitch to Anakin was that the the view of the Force that you're getting from the Jedi is is limited. It's narrow. It's doctrinal. It it, it, it I'm going to give you the larger view of things where you're not going to be as limited or as held back. Um, I, I think it does hold them back. I think it holds them back. Uh, well, it clearly does. But, you know, what they say about villains is that every villain is the hero of his own story. Yeah. So in their point of view, they're doing it uh, for good in the sense, you know, a lot of uh, maniacal people think that they're going to control other people's lives for their own good. Because, you know, you're cl clearly not capable on your own. And so I'm going to go ahead and make these decisions for you. Right. But after this big fake out, um, we get uh, a moment where the, the, you know, Kylo obviously can't let Snoke see, you know, he's hiding things from Snoke uh, throughout the sequel trilogy films that we've seen so far. And even in this comic, he's always hiding from Snoke is something that, you know, whether it be through his mask or through. Um, you know, uh, just psychological games that he's playing even up until the end. He's playing Snoke. Snoke's like, I can feel you making your choice, blah, 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 blah. And what the choice is he's about to kill Snoke. That's the choice he's making. So here what he does is he blows up the cave. Uh, so the cave is destroyed. And Coom. yeah, uh, yeah, that's a yeah, coom. There's not, not even an explanation point. So it's probably not like, Boom! It's more like... No, it's like a duller... Boom. Boom. Yeah. Um, like those charges in episode two. You know? Um, so anyway, he blows up the cave. Um, so that interrupts 
you know, the, the, the connection that he has with Kylo, he'll never know that he didn't actually take out mom and dad. Um, but that's not enough. Kylo still, or uh, Snoke still scolds him a little bit. He says, you know, I would like to, uh, you know, I really wish he hadn't blown this whole thing up. <laughs> I know. You know, he's like, geez, did you have to blow the whole thing up? This is a, this is an important, <laughs> Yoda trained Luke here. Have some respect. Uh, he says, I would have liked to have brought other apprentices. And Kylo's response is great. It is, it is a great line, a great moment where he's like, you won't need other apprentices. He says, uh, your show of power is impressive, but that cave stood for thousands of years. The past is the past. Oh, yeah. To bring other apprentices to it. You don't need other apprentices. <laughs> so I, I, my Kylo voice. Is probably, I actually like your Kylo. Eh, it's, it's probably a little too much Nicolas Cage. <laughs> but uh, well, you know, let's face it. I you put a few your... years on Adam Driver. Right. And he's doing Honeymoon in Vegas, too. All right. <laughs> yeah. So um, I am a Coppola. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I know I, I've noted uh, similarities between Kylo and uh, or Adam Driver and uh, Nicholas Cage. <laughs> I dare say I think Adam Driver's a better actor. Uh, yeah. 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 And, and I am a Ghost Rider fan. Well, but, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> skydiving Elvis is not so much. So. Um, so the, the book ends and, um, you know, I, I, again, they're using the, the, the these places that you can go to mm-hmm. where it's like, come visit the forest, you know, send a, <laughs> send a, a postcard from the dark side cave or something. And I, I, I have trouble grasping the idea that the force is a place to go. Um, a lot of people talk about Mortis and I still maintain to this day that that was a shared vision between the three Jedi, Ahsoka, Obi-Wan and Anakin. I never thought of Mortis as a place that they could go back to. Could you think of Mortis like a giant Dagobah cave? where all three of them went in and had a shared experience. But it didn't really play out that way. If you watch those episodes closely from season three of the clone wars, they Mm -hmm. never actually land their ship. They all pass out. Well, I guess I'm just, I'm, I'm making a connection between uh, not necessarily the structure, the physical place, but the, the experience. Was it more of a, Dagobah cave type yeah. of experience. Well, if, if you want to consider that to be a vision itself, and we know that Luke receives a vision in the dark side cave on Dagobah. We know mm-hmm. that's a vision. We know that didn't really happen. We know Darth Vader himself wasn't appearing in front of Luke that was manifested via the force. But I think Luke could have received that vision wherever he was at that point in his training mm-hmm. and at that point in his relationship to his master, Yoda. Yeah. I think uh, if Ben had lived and been able to train Luke, Luke would have had a vision maybe similar to that, but maybe not on the cave on Dagobah. Could have happened in the lavatory on the Millennium Falcon. <laughs> Believe me, I've had a lot of strange visions on airplane lavatory. So, um, a lavatory well, too. Now, I never call it a lavatory anywhere else, but on an airplane. Has you, have you ever heard anyone call uh, a, a restroom, a bathroom, a lavatory? I had a teacher in elementary school once that always oh. referred to the lavatory. The lavatory. And I, as a kid, I remember thinking like laboratory, laboratory, boy, I, I can, what kind of experiments are going on in there? Uh. Well, this has been awesome. Uh, I've really enjoyed this discussion. I hope uh, you folks listening and watching have enjoyed it as well. Uh, If you like this type of thing where we take a deep dive into an issue of a comic book, uh, please let us know. Show at rebelforceradio.com. We love to have that feedback. Um, Jim, I'll just give you my my final thoughts on this. Uh, I enjoyed it. It was a very, very quick read, uh, which I appreciate. And uh, it gave me a lot to think about. There was... Um, there was a part of me and, you know, you and I had an initial conversation where I was like, no, the Dagobah cave is sacred. I don't want Snoke going there. I don't want Kylo Ren going there. That was special between, uh, Luke and Yoda. 
but after having read the comic, um, I'm okay with it. I'm also okay with the with the fact that these comics typically have very little ramifications for what we see yeah, in, in the cinematic just, well, uh, films or the, you know some stories movies. just work in the comic book medium yeah. that wouldn't necessarily work anywhere else and a story like this you know maybe that that qualifies so that's why i enjoy reading these comics it does take a little bit of the pressure off when you consider the overall mythology of star wars and also kind of shows why there's so much pressure on the filmmakers of today as they try to continue the story, the Skywalker saga. It's, uh, it's not an easy task. And maybe, you know, maybe Ryan Johnson would be more effective if he was writing for Marvel. I don't know. All right, well, uh, let me ask you this. Come <laughs> at the end of this month, or excuse me, at the end of December, we'll have seen the rise of Skywalker. Will we look back and we'll say that any of that was foreshadowed in this uh, Snoke comic book? No, <laughs> no, no way, no way. Because yeah. Snoke was killed off halfway through Episode Eight. I, that's the whole thing. So that that ring isn't going to show up. No, yeah. no. But you also have to assume that there's going to be nothing in Episode Nine that will necessarily make this story null and void either. It's yeah, being right, published right, at a time right. when the uh, infamous story group feels like it's a safe time to start revealing a little bit of background about this character of Snoke, which leads me to believe they actually know where they're going with his story at this point, which was probably not a reality until recently. And, you know, I, I hear a lot of uh, rumors about the rise of Skywalker and I read things online just like everyone else, but uh, I think everything is uh, in, in a very fluid motion right now where there could be several different outcomes at play maybe multiple endings for the film and maybe mm -hmm. you know I, I think i think a lot of things are being considered right now um and there's a rumor about reshoots happening too some reshoots uh, last minute things it'll just be little pickup things that they discovered they need to include you know, once they've gone into the editing suite, they say, oh, we really, uh, it would be really great if we had something to take this from point A to point B. Well, and you so know, look, when you think about how uh, easy it is to change something that's that's much larger. So, so take, for example, at the end of The Force Awakens, J.J. Abrams had Luke Skywalker staring off into the sea with surrounded by boulders that he was holding up into the force yes by just taking some cgi eraser some white out and so it's it completely changes the ending of that film if it even got that far but i believe that in the original script the shooting script it did say that luke was surrounded by these floating boulders it was or or actually the way it was explained to Mark Hamill on set by J.J. Abrams is right. really how we know about this, is that J.J. had told him, yeah, we'll be, there'll be something there that demonstrates your connection to the Force. Right. Hmm. And so they shot that, and then... Yeah, it didn't happen. All of a sudden, disconnect. <laughs> right. Someone pulled right. the plug. <laughs> All right, well, we're going to pull the plug on this uh, special edition of Rebel Force Radio. This has been a blast. Uh, like I say, if you enjoyed this, please let us know. Show at rebelforceradio.com. And uh, until next time, for Rebel Force Radio, I'm Jason. I'm Jimmy Mack. And remember, the Force will be with you always. I could never forget. <laughs>